Thanks everyone for tuning in and joining us for another webinar. This time our topic, women's health. As women, how do we feel about our own health? Ayurveda considers the menstrual cycle a blessing rather than a curse. Pregnancy, a time for nourishment. And menopause, a natural transition. So how do we shift towards a more natural approach in order to prime our bodies each and every day and ease these life's transitions. Now joining us today is integrative neurologist and author of The Prime, Dr. Kolri Chowdhury. Thank you for joining us again, Dr. Chowdhury. We're so excited to have you back. I am so happy to be here, and hopefully we'll be able to answer the questions of why would a neurologist be interested in women's health? <laughs> and what's amazing is this connection between you know, the digestive system, the mind, and our hormonal health, when you understand those three pieces, uh, women are really able to reclaim their health. And for me personally, as you know, I've transitioned into my 40s and have started to approach the hormonal changes of perimenopause, I've really, really appreciated how important it is to understand this link between the digestive system and hormonal health. So we're going to dive into that today with everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and we did have quite a few questions. And thank you to everyone who submitted a question as well. So let's get right into those questions. This one we got a lot. So what's going on with cramps, mood swings, skin breakouts around the time of the cycle? <laughs> so... Traditionally, in Ayurvedic medicine, women are supposed to rest during their menstrual cycles. And when I first got this information, because you know I was a young doctor, I thought this was the most sexist assumption in Ayurvedic medicine. And I really fought it because I was like, you know, we're not broken just because we're having periods. And it really didn't take. Um, it, did, it took my own personal maturation into um, appreciating a woman's physiology because we're raised in such a masculine society that even women approach their own bodies from a very masculine perspective. And as I started to dive deeper into this knowledge, I really began to appreciate the wisdom of this recommendation because what happens during a menstrual cycle is very, very, very deep detoxification and there's actually a loss of prana. So there's a loss of life force through our blood. And it's for a purpose. It's for a releasing of all of the excess doshas that are found in our bodies. And so, you know, when we have the cramps and the mood swings, um, that's often due to a release of vata. And during our menstrual cycle, there's naturally an increase in vata because that's part of the process of menstruation. But, you know, the breakouts can be from excess pitta, excess kapha, but all of this excess, do excess dosha and excess toxins are actually being released. So it's not that we're doing nothing during our menstrual cycle. We're actually having a huge cleanse. And my recommendation for anybody when they're doing a cleanse is to take extra rest, you know, take extra fluids, just really nourish yourselves. And so women are actually blessed that we have this process that our body naturally does on a monthly basis so it doesn't allow for the accumulation of some of these toxins the same way that we would see sometimes in men as they age but when we don't take the time to rest then we'll experience these symptoms of mood swings and cramps and breakouts because we're fighting what our body is trying to naturally do now for those lucky women who actually are able to rest and you know what does even rest mean it really means like doing nothing for the first three days of your cycle, which, you know, even now I struggle with that because we don't really live in a culture that allows for it. But I do my absolute best to reduce my schedule and whenever it's possible to cancel everything for those first three days. And when you're allowed to do that, the body will be allowed to cleanse with all of the energy that it needs. For those who aren't able to do that, there's things that you can do during the month to make those symptoms less. So just doing things like the prime tea, taking um, trifla, doing the psyllium and flax, you know, doing some of these simple, simple daily routines helps to reduce how much your body has to re release at the time of the menstrual cycle. Hmm. Okay. Now, 
What, okay, so I'm sure you just answered this question, but what about working out during cycle? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the sad thing is, I remember a time in my life where I would do that. And I, I think it's a uniquely kind of, you know, American thing of like, don't let your period get you down. And you see like the commercials, right? You see like the commercials for like tampons and stuff where it's like, don't let your period get you down. Your period's not trying to get you down. It's trying to heal your body. And so again, it's just, it's respecting those natural cycles. And again, for me, you know, I was a uh, very career driven, very intellectual woman. And so it was very hard for me to appreciate that my body was actually doing something on my behalf because I felt like it was, you know, just this total break once a month. And I was like, I'm not going to let that get me down. But exercising during your menstrual cycle, you will just lose more prana. And the hard thing about this is you don't realize the impact of this so much in your teens or even in your 20s. But by the time you hit your mid 30s, and especially once you get to your 40s, you pay the price of everything that you have done to your reproductive system. So things like working out, it's just not worth doing for those three days. You know, that's fine after your period. You know, if you feel like you have the energy and the desire, go right ahead. But if you're going to do anything, sometimes, you know, we'll recommend doing some yoga, but oftentimes we don't even recommend that. So really just taking that time to rest and also taking that time to see what might come out because what's coming out during your menstrual cycle is really a reflection of what is accumulating in your body over the entire month. Okay. Now, um, someone asks, I've heard the downward flow during menstruation can be blocked by using tampons or even menstrual cups, which is something I think that's new. It wasn't around probably right. um, the beginning of Ayurveda. But what is the Ayurvedic recommendation during the cycle so that we don't block that flow, but we still have some kind of modern solution? Right. <laughs> So yes, this is true. And what's even worse is doing something like an IUD where it blocks your periods altogether. And when I see women in my clinic who have IUDs, it's one of the first things we do is get rid of those IUDs. Um, but the Ayurvedic recommendation really is just to allow that full downward flow. And so just, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to go and squat in your backyard for three days, um, you know, you just, you put on a pad, but you don't want to block that menstrual blood from exiting your body. That's really the most important thing that it fully exits, you know, your body. And I feel like, you know, when you don't understand what is happening and what is actually being released in that menstrual blood, there's this feeling of like, oh, I want to do anything I can to just minimize this. But when you understand what your body's actually trying to purge from it, you know, um, during the cycle, you really will appreciate that, okay, we want this to leave our body. So just using a pad is, you know, it's perfectly fine. Um, but just not doing anything that would be lodged up into the vaginal canal, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is probably news to a lot of us. <laughs> yes, I know. I have a lot of young women who, especially now because we're really promoting somehow, you know, that feminine empowerment means not having your period. And it's like, no, that's not being empowered at all. As women, we have periods. Feminine empowerment is embracing that, honoring that, and not allowing society to dictate what you should feel like during your menstrual cycle and allowing your body just to experience what it needs to experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, since the body is, it's going through so much during that, that period, how does stress play a role at all into the cycle? Oh, it's huge. I mean, it's just like how stress plays a role in anything. You know, it throws off our neuroendocrine system. It throws off our reproductive hormonal cycles. Um, you know, it can lead to so many different hormonal imbalances and we see the, you know, the ultimate effects of that on the reproductive system because the reproductive system is the last tissue to be nourished. According to Ayurveda, the health of the reproductive tissue is really a reflection of what is happening in all of the other tissues in the body. And so when the, when the body is stressed, the organ system that will reap the, the 
consequence of that stress, um, more so than any other tissue in the body, is going to be the reproductive system. Mm -hmm. So managing stress, and you know, and that's not just like oh, a change in mental attitude. I mean, I look at stress as just a physiological marker, and so it means oh, hold on, there's something going on. It usually means there's something. Um, that needs to be balanced in the digestive system. It usually means that the adrenals are taxed. It usually means that the thyroid is taxed. And so we look at it from, you know, a biochemical standpoint. Mm -hmm. and, and now you mentioned triphala as a good herb that for, you know, this, this time of our lives, I guess. But what, what other herbs for or um, treatments for supporting reproductive health? So it's, you know, interesting as people do the program in my book, The Prime, one of the first things that they will realize is, hey, my menstrual cycles are actually better. And in the very beginning, they may actually even notice that the menstrual cycle is um, heavier and that they'll have, you know, um, more discharge, more clots. And it's just because the body is actually removing toxins. But then over time, they'll notice that um, the flow is lighter, it's more comfortable, it's more regular. And so just doing that, that program in the book, because it helps to improve digestion and remove toxins, that's really the first step in helping to normalize your period is improving digestion, removing toxins. And, you know, we incorporate uh, meditation as part of the program. So it also helps with stress reduction. That is always the first step. Now, if people are still having problems, and quite honestly, the majority of, of women, um, especially in the younger years, like in 20s and 30s, that's all they need. Now, as you go into menopause, then we will add other herbs. And that is highly, highly, highly dependent on the woman. Because some of the traditional herbs we used to use, like Shatavari, for um, menstrual problems is actually inappropriate for certain conditions that we are now seeing for the first time in history, such as estrogen dominance. In those cases, we're actually cautious of using some of the traditional herbs because it'll increase estrogen even more, which is traditionally what you wanted to do when people went into menopause. But now we're seeing conditions where progesterone is so low because your body's using it to convert into cortisol as a stress response. So again, there's traditional Ayurvedic herbs that we've used, but we're seeing conditions currently in women, typically by mid thirties, that we've never seen before because of environmental factors, because of stress level. And so we have to modify our approach. So I typically recommend, you know, we always first strengthen digestion, reduce stress, remove toxins. And then after that, if the body still needs further support, then I'll give individual recommendations. Mm. Okay. Just like with all Ayurveda, it's not a one size fits all. <laughs> but even less so nowadays, because we have certain conditions that we never saw in the past, you know, and particularly for women. And women often ask, you know, why is that? Well, a lot of the chemicals that have been created, there's over 100,000 new chemicals created. Many of them stimulate estrogen receptors in women. This is one of the reasons why we're seeing so much more autoimmunity in women. And so these chemical compounds are toxic, but they're particularly toxic to women. So it, it's becoming even more individualized because some of the classic approaches to women's health are no longer appropriate until you balance certain things first. And then you can incorporate, you know, some of these herbs, but you have to balance some of the effects of the environment and stress that women are seeing for the first time in history now. Hmm. Well, now somebody asks, what can I do about my hot flashes? <laughs> <laughs> you beat your husband. <laughs> Sauce it like that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's several things that you can do. Um, so the hot flashes are coming because your body is transitioning from vata into pitta. And so as that vata is increased, it's actually moving all of the heat up to the surface. So it's a strange phenomenon because you're actually colder inside and hotter on the surface. And so you approach it by balancing both the vata and the pitta. And because the hot flashes are oftentimes accompanied by you know, emotional discharges as well. And that's that, you know, pitta component. And so, you know, just looking at what is a vata pacifying routine to reduce how much heat is getting pushed out. 
So very, very regular routine, reducing overall stimulation, going to bed early, meditating regularly. And then looking specifically though at some of the foods that aggravate pitta, so the really spicy foods, alcohol, coffee, you want to reduce those in particular. And people are often surprised at things like, you know, ginger, garlic, black pepper, you know, things that they would normally consider as healthy, things like onions, but they're pitta aggravating. And so when you're starting to have hot flashes, this is a time to first reduce those. Mm -hmm. Absolutely wonderful thing to add on for hot flashes is aloe vera juice. And you can do it in two different ways, taking um, just a couple tablespoons, anywhere from one to three, and putting it in eight ounces of warm water and drinking it first thing in the morning. Or you can also, in addition to that or in place of that, take about a tablespoon and just a little bit of warm water and take that after meals. But the aloe vera is balancing to all of the um, tissues, but it's particularly helpful for women um, for reproductive organ function. And, you know, this is also when we will talk about adding certain herbs, as I mentioned before, like Shatavari, but because of, as I already mentioned, the modern day phenomenon for women, you have to be careful not to do anything that increases estrogen too much until both estrogen and progesterone are a little bit more balanced. So there are specific herbs we use, but Val, again, I'm always surprised, you know, at how many women they'll do the prime and afterwards they're like, wow, I can't believe what an improvement I have in my hot flashes. Now, the only caveat in that is when you do the stage that involves Google, the third stage, your hot flashes oftentimes will increase because it's a heating herb, but that's used for detoxification. And then once you're done with that stage, the hot flashes usually go away completely. If they still persist, that is when you would want to work individually with an Ayurvedic practitioner to come up with a specific formulation. But hot flashes are, you know, they're absolutely treatable. Mm -hmm. You don't have to live with them. Yeah, which is such a nurturing approach to it. Now, okay, I know we're gonna get this one a lot, this question, what about hormone replacement therapy? Is, is that recommended at all? So I take a softer approach to this. Um, first of all, I do oftentimes work with hormone replacement therapy, but I will do completely um, bioidentical hormones. I look at hormone replacement therapy, much like I look at medications, you have to meet somewhere where, someone where they're at. And if they're in a place where they are severely, severely depleted, um, and you know, having such s significant symptoms that they have no quality of life, I will incorporate hormone replacement therapy, but I do it quite differently. I oftentimes will not add estrogen first. I'll oftentimes add a natural progesterone first because the majority of the symptoms that most women are having who are approaching menopause or are in menopause is actually a, a um, result of estrogen dominance. And what that means is, yes, your estrogen is going down, but your progesterone is going down much faster. And so they need support for progesterone. So I have done that quite successfully, but when you do it using all of the Ayurvedic herbs, you end up using extremely, extremely small amounts in comparison to what um, traditional like ob will do. Um, and we are able to taper them off. Um, so it's not, you know, a long-term fix. Their body kicks in, but sometimes, you know, that will take like a year to get them to that point. And then we just slowly start to taper off. So I'm by no means... You know, against it, I always say try to get the most natural sources, but people oftentimes jump on the estrogen train when they actually need to be on progesterone. Mm -hmm. And when, once I get them on it, but it's the same thing. I'll, I'll have them start the stages in the prime first, and then we look to see how we can get them, you know, off very, very easily, totally asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. Okay, then... What about um, as we age, someone asks, is vaginal dryness a symptom of menopause or is, is that just something that happens naturally? It's not something that should happen naturally. It's a symptom of being depleted as you go into menopause. And, you know, unfortunately, so much of the way that we describe aging, especially for women, we have just made these assumptions that this is just what happens and, you know, as I mentioned before, women are aging in a way that we've never seen before. It's happening way too fast. It's happening in a very um, disorganized way in terms of the balance between estrogen and progesterone. And so vaginal dryness 
is a sign of depletion in menopause, but it does not have to be the way that women age. And this is what I find to be really fascinating. And it's something that I'm still hoping to be able to write about in the future because to approach women's health now, it goes beyond even just what we were taught in the Vedic tradition. You have to incorporate some of the, as I mentioned before, environmental impacts, but there are specific practices in the Vedic tradition for preserving prana in the body. And when women start to do that, you know, ideally like at age 35, but definitely by age 40, you reverse a lot of this loss of energy and it makes menopause extremely easy and you actually don't have a lot of these symptoms. And this is some, you know, some of these practices um, have, they've literally been reserved for like 0.1% of the population. <laughs> you know, they were never shared and they're just starting to come out, but they completely change the way that your body enters menopause. So it's not that it's the only way to do it, you know, to go through all of this. It's just that's the most common way that women are going into menopause, but it's, it's absolutely a sign of depletion. Hmm. Okay. And once, once we do go through menopause, and so we've talked about how there's this monthly cleanse, you know, when we're in our teens and 20s and 30s and 40s, and what happens to the body when, when we're done with that monthly cleanse? Is there something that we should replace that monthly cleanse with? That's actually a very, very good question. So, you know, there's certain conditions that if a woman has it, we can almost completely cure it because we can use the, men the menstrual cycle as a way to deeply detoxify the body. And if a man has it, we may be able to treat the symptoms, but we may not be able to completely reverse it. And so the menstrual cycle is a really, really powerful way that the body detoxifies. And when you, you stop having that menstrual cycle, you know, not just because of the loss of ability to remove toxins, but there's also, you know, just the whole um, side of the depletion that your body does need some more assistance. And there's some simple things that, you know, you can do. I mean, part of it is doing something on a daily basis. So doing things like the triflet, doing things like the prime tea, doing abhyanga every single day, those are things that help to move toxins out daily so that they don't accumulate. But then, you know, once a month, um, I think it's a great idea to consider, you know, even just doing like an oil enema at home once a month or, you know, twice a month, just to help to remove some of those impurities that may be accumulating. And then, you know, at least seasonally, perhaps just doing like a very small detox, um, you know, maybe just even adding Google for like a week in between each season. And then once a year doing something like the prime, or if you can go for Panchakarma, that it's, you know, beyond just doing it monthly, it's, it's what do you do daily? What are you doing monthly? What are you doing seasonally? And then what are you doing annually? And it becomes really more important um, once we stop having menstrual cycles. So I think it's a, it's a wonderful strategy for aging in a way where we feel vibrant and still, you know, alive and feel comfortable in our bodies. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I've heard that Abhyanga, of course, is great for a, da a daily nourishment and a, a detox. Why is it that it isn't recommended to do during the menstrual cycle? Oh, great question. So during your menstrual cycle, you're actually removing toxins in multiple different ways. And so obviously downward through the menstrual blood, but even through your skin, you're removing toxins. And so you really want to just kind of allow the body to do what it's doing. And you don't want to just do anything that will disrupt the downward flow. And it seems like, you know, how could doing a massage possibly disrupt the downward flow? But you know, in the traditional texts, they even talk about how even just cooking, because the fire has the prana moving upward, that when a woman cooks during her menstrual cycle, even that disrupts the downward flow. So we just really allow for the body to do whatever it needs to do for those first you know, three days. So, and that includes not doing any type of um, abhyanga. Hmm. Okay. And I'll, I love the idea of taking a few days off from working out, from cooking. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it helps when you have a very supportive spouse. It's wonderful when you have a spouse who is actually trained in Ayurvedic medicine. You know, <laughs> I do. And then it's like, you know, our household just goes into, oh, okay, this is your time to go inward. And so it's really, really helpful when the household understands the knowledge behind what a woman is actually going through once a month and also the contribution she is making to her family and to her community when she's taking care of herself. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, any last words for us, Dr. Chowdhury, any kind of encouragement for us? Yeah, I think, you know, the feminist movement in the U.S. has focused mainly on how women are as good as men. And I would just say, we're not as good as men. We're as good as women. I mean, we don't have to become men. <laughs> I don't want to become a man, you know. Um, that we really need to be able to give ourselves the space and give other women the space to honor what it means to be a woman rather than being thrown into this competition because we do have completely different bodies. But that doesn't mean that our contribution is any less. And if anything, at least from the traditional you know, Vedic approach, that when a woman is living in balance, that automatically creates balance in the household and that then further creates balance in the society. And so when you have a culture where women's health is honored, you actually create a culture that lives in balance naturally. Mm -hmm. That's empowering right there. Just, <laughs> just that idea, <laughs> supporting each other and uplifting each other. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chaudhary, for joining us again. We're always so happy to have you. And we get a lot of feedback after our webinar as well from, from people that love all of your knowledge that you bring. So thank you. It's my pleasure. And I'm so happy that we did something to dedicate some time to women. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We're so grateful to have you back with us. If there are any future webinars or topics that you would like for us to host, please let us know. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.